Welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another jam-packed, action-filled information overload for this 1st of August, 2019. Yes, it is August already. Now, if you remember January, it was kind of like January. Then February was February. Then March. Then April, May, June, July, and August. That's the way the year went. January, February, extremely long. March, April, May, kind of short, mid, mid range, and then it's like June, July, gone. And here we are. Uh, this coming weekend is the uh, Washington County Fair. And a couple of weeks we'll be at the State Fair. A month from now, Labor Day. And then, get ready for Halloween. Did you pick out your costume yet? Dallas, did you pick out your Halloween costume yet? No, he didn't. He, uh, my producer's going to go as the same thing he always does every year. Curmudgeon. He's going to go as uh, the old curmudgeon Dallas Pearson. <coughs> Anyhow, since we do have a jam-packed action-filled information overload headed this way, I've already exceeded the uh, allowable time that Dallas has given me to talk for this show. He did tell me that I only had about 10 seconds because we've got so much content. Uh, so we're going to go right into our Prager University segment of the day. Actually, we're going to be doing two Prager University segments because uh, they're both related to each other and to our show content. Because, as we mentioned last week, the wall that heals, the moving wall, the, the uh, three-quarter scale Vietnam Veterans Memorial was in Stillwater this last weekend that we're doing this entire show about Vietnam. We're not doing it too much about the politics and policies, but about a tribute to the people who fight. Now that does mean we have to look at the context about why did America fight the Vietnam War, and also as to um, uh, you know, telling the truth about the Vietnam War, about what happened after uh, American involvement ceased. And so that's, those are kind of the bookends. And we're going to start off with why did America fight the Vietnam War from our first Prager University segment of the day. The Vietnam War lasted 10 years, cost America 58,000 lives, and over a trillion dollars adjusted for inflation. It brought down a president, stirred social unrest, and ended in defeat. No one in hindsight believes fighting a losing war is ever worth the cost. Consequently, the Vietnam War is usually written off as a colossal strategic blunder and a humanitarian disaster. Yet historical appraisals might have been much different had the Vietnam War followed the pattern of the Korean War, which the United States fought for almost identical reasons, the defense of freedom in Asia. The U.S. had military advisors in Vietnam during the 1950s, but didn't become involved in a major way until 1963. President John F. Kennedy firmly believed in the domino effect, the foreign policy theory that vulnerable nations without help would fall one after another, like dominoes, to external communist aggression. Kennedy thus hoped to stop Soviet and Chinese-backed communist invasions in the manner President Harry Truman had in Korea by taking a stand in Vietnam. As with Korea was a war the United States did not seek. As with Korea, Vietnam presented no imperial advantages no natural resources or resources of any kind that the United States needed to protect or wished to obtain. As with Korea, the aggressor was a communist government in the North intent on taking control of the South, and its military crossed an internationally recognized border to do so. Following Kennedy's assassination in November of 1963, President Lyndon Johnson vastly escalated America's role in 1964. But even as he did so, Johnson prosecuted the war with deep ambivalence authorizing significantly more troops and money for the war, but never pushing for total victory. In contrast, the North Vietnamese never wavered. They ignored every one of Johnson's many offers to negotiate a settlement. By 1971, the war was at a stalemate, neither side able to establish a clear advantage. The President, Richard Nixon, pursued a two-pronged strategy to turn over combat operations to the South Vietnamese and to bomb North Vietnam. The effort brought the communists to the Paris peace talks, and by 1973, the North agreed to a general settlement, establishing two autonomous Vietnamese nations, one communist, one non-communist, in the manner of North and South Korea. 
However, the Watergate scandal, the subsequent resignation of President Nixon, and the Democrats' sweeping congressional victory in the 1974 midterm election all helped to convince the North Vietnamese that America would not enforce the peace agreement. They were right. Without U.S. air support and material aid, the South Vietnamese had no chance against the North. Well supplied by the Soviet Union and the Chinese, the Communists gained full control over the country in April 1975. The war proved far more costly than Korea because the geography and landscapes of Vietnam were far more conducive to insurgency operations. There were also far more restrictions placed on American commanders than during the Korean War. And the United States in the 1960s was a far less conservative and cohesive country than America of the 1950s. Yet despite the long ordeal and terrible costs, South Vietnam was saved in 1973, only to be lost in 1975. The U.S. defeat in Vietnam was a political choice, not a military necessity. Had the U.S. protected an independent but vulnerable South Vietnam in 1973 and 4, that country would have most likely followed the model of South Korea. Millions of Southeast Asians would not have become boat people and refugees or have been sent to the gulags and re-education camps. A viable U.S.-backed democratic Vietnam would have stabilized the region and almost certainly prevented the neighboring Cambodian genocide in which one-fifth of that country, two million people, were slaughtered by its communist leadership. And much of the bitterness over the war on both sides of the American political spectrum, still with us today, would have vanished. And for the communist Vietnamese, the instigators and aggressors of the terrible conflict, what was it all for? Today, ironically, the Vietnamese government aspires to nothing more than the capitalist affluence that it once reviled. I'm Victor Davis Hansen of the Hoover Institution for Prager University. So for those of you who are too young to remember the Vietnam War uh, and don't understand what was fought over, that's a, a brief, a very, very brief brief. Uh, but what we're going to go into now is the beginning of telling stories because there are over 58,000 names on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial on the wall. And there are, I think there are like two or three million veterans who served over there. Everyone has a different story. And then that's what we want to focus on for the rest of this show. Uh, so we're going to look at a Stars and Stripes video on a veteran who shares his story at the Vietnam Wall. This is the one in Washington, not the uh, moving wall. On the day that I was wounded, uh, July 29, 1967, it was Operation Kingfisher. And we lost 251 wounded and 28 dead in two days of fighting. They were all around us, they were yelling, Marines, you die, you die, Marines, you know, and it was like, oh shit, you know, this is serious business, man. You know, so, um, and, and you know, a few years back, I was here in Washington, D.C., after I got wounded, I didn't know who made it or who didn't came, come out alive, because there was so many, such chaos, you know, and then I'm here in Washington, D.C., and I find out there's a reunion with the 9th Marines. So I go to that reunion, and uh, I walk around, I talk to people, there's nobody I know, nobody I recognize, no names, and so I'm getting ready to leave, and this, uh, in fact, I met the guy's wife today, and he's passed, he passed away last year, but he was his gunnery sergeant, and he said, hey, who'd you serve with? And I said, 2nd Battalion, 9th Marines, hotel company. He said, what squad were you in? 1st Platoon, 1st Squad. He said, oh, you were with Murner's boys. And I said, Gunny, you know Murner? He said, yeah. I said, do you know if he made it out alive or not? He said, yeah, he's here today. I said, you're kidding. He said, look, right here on the book. And there was his name, James Murner and son. I turned around and I yelled as loud as I could, Murner, are you in the room? Nobody answered. I went down to the bar. I went over to the, the desk registration. I asked every Marine I saw. I said, excuse me, sir, what's your name? You know, and they tell me, and it's like, oh, no. I, I, I missed him. And so the next day I'm going to the Lane of the Reef at Arlington and I go by the hotel and there's this old man standing there with his son and they're looking at the thing and I said, excuse me, sir, what's your name? 
He said, James Murner. I said, man, it sent chills through me because he was from Alabama. I said, James, you were my squad leader in Vietnam. He said, I was. He said, what's your name? I said, Larry Yapez. He said, man, I don't remember you. He said, but I did three tours in Vietnam. I said, our, our squad was Miller, Marx, Camicho, Ramirez, Rodriguez, Doc Fitzgerald. He said, oh, you were there my first tour when we was in the shit every day. And I said, you know what? What's your birthday? He said, July 29th. I said, yeah, that was the day we got hit. And we were just singing happy birthday to him. We had a little palm cake with some cocoa around it, and we're singing happy birthday when they hit us. You know, and from that moment on, we fought all day long into the night. And the only thing that kept them off of us was airstrikes. They dropped napalm all around us, and they had artillery. If it wasn't for that, they would have they would have wiped us out. You know? So every day is a blessing. Every day is like, thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's just one of the many, many, many stories of Vietnam veterans and their time in combat. We're going to take a look right now at a Wisconsin veteran, Al Subkowiak, and see what he has to share. Just as I stood up, I was looking up the river and down the river, and there was about seven or eight Viet Cong that was on the opposite side of the river, and they jumped out of these little holes that they were buried in, and uh, my guys got online, and they started firing like crazy. And we had a good little battle there going. And uh, then the Viet Cong just, it went silent. They were gone. They just opened fire, and then they take off back into the bushes. And I got hit in the legs. What's up here? What's in here? Three, three shot holes I got. And uh, my radio man, I told him as soon as we got hit, I said, call the, seat, the command post and tell them we're getting hit. He picked up his radio, was talking, and a bullet went right through here and knocked his two fingers off. And I said, uh, he held his hand up, you know, with no fingers like this. He said, I, I can't talk. I said, well, use your other hand. <laughs> so they brought a medevac chopper. And um, then they took us to the battalion aid station. The doctor came in on a plane there, and he said, oh, geez, we can't handle you guys here. He said, that's too serious. So they took us back to someplace in Da Nang. I have no idea where. The next thing I know, we was all laying under these big lights. Some doctor had his hand in my leg, you know, was pulling out shrapnel and bullets or whatever the hell was in there. And then the corpsman came by and he was supposed to finish up debriefing it, I guess they call it. He had these long tweezers like, and he was going way on my leg and pulling all that skin out and shrapnel. He said, you want one of these tweezers to help pull it out? I said, no, hell no. I didn't want to look at that. So I, I didn't want to see nothing. And then uh, the radio guy, I, I don't know what happened to his fingers. They were gone. And I never saw those guys since. I have no idea where they went. And whether they lived or died, I don't know. It was kind of a depressing war at the end there, you know. Booby traps, more booby traps, more guys getting killed. And we couldn't do nothing. I mean, they bombed the hell out of Hanoi. They bombed the hell out of the trail. They bombed the hell out of everything. Nothing changed. So, you know, the only thing I could, as I look back on it, why didn't we get out four years earlier? <laughs> because we, we won nothing over there. And you kind of got to say that about some of the other little wars we're getting into. <laughs> you know, you go over there, you expend all these men. For what? You leave and it goes right back to the same. So, but now, I don't want to think about it. You know, I'm alive. And uh, with that, it looks like we have one of our clips that may be a little bit out of place. Um, we are going to look at one more story before we show you the uh, wall in Stillwater. Um, my Vietnam War story, Mardeo Cannon from California. Uh, that should be our next clip. And looking over at our producer, does he have it? Dallas, do you have our clip? Mm -hmm. 
and I'm not sure what's going on. We're having some technical difficulties. So in the meantime, while he's looking for that, um, uh, you know, I've, I'm, I'm the son of a Vietnam veteran. My father, he served his 13-month tour in the United States Marine Corps. Uh, most of most of the fathers of the kids I grew up with were Vietnam veterans, and I spent time wor working on a, as a volunteer lobbyist for Minnesota Won't Forget POWMA Incorporated. The way the Vietnam veteran was treated when he came home was shameful, and I think that's something we can all agree on 50 years later. It was quite shameful. Uh, but the fact is, um, it happened. And as what I hope we'll see a little bit later is the reason why the Vietnam Veterans Memorial is so important is because it no, the, their service is no longer something to be ashamed of. These guys went there and did a job. Whether you like the job they did or not is regardless. And, this, and the treatment of the Vietnam veteran did actually improve conditions for successive generations of veterans, including mine. That it's okay to disagree about the policy that sends these guys to war, but it is not okay to disparage those who are actually upholding the duty and doing their job going to war. And Dallas, where are we at on our video? Okay, we're holding on for just one second here. Um, and the thing with veterans, we, we, we talk about this during World War II and World War I observances, everybody has a story. And for the Vietnam generation, it's time for their stories to be up front and center. And we know that the, Vietnam, uh, the World War II generation, it took a long time for them to get the recognition that they, that they were due. Uh, Korean War veterans are there as well that their stories still need to be told because they're just behind the World War II generation. But right now it's, th it's time for the Vietnam story to be told. And so we're going to look at Mardeo Cannon's story right now. We were stupid. After high school, I had the grades to go to college. I was on the honor society. And one day, we, we didn't get a college scholarship. We just said, let's go join the Army. We knew that the Vietnam War was growing, and it was going hot and, and getting heavier. And you know, at that time, we were 17 and 18 years old, and we didn't pay too much attention. Uh, I know I didn't to all the ramification of the Vietnam War. They asked us what field we want to go into, and so we just said, uh, medical. We chose medical because we felt that uh, we would not get on the battlefield. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, uh, we didn't know that that is a pathway to the battlefield. The initial basic training was eight weeks and another additional eight weeks of training and um, being an operating room specialist. It was uh, fun, learn how to work in, in uh, an operating room environment and uh, it was good training. And after that, I went to Valley Ford General Army Hospital in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania for almost a year uh, to further our training. Then I was stationed at Fort Lee, Virginia for my duty. And at Fort Lee, that's where I got my orders and people was coming back from Vietnam. That's when I finally found out, you know, what was really going on over there because we had some returning veterans uh, who had been to Vietnam. I never will forget uh, the drive in from the airport through Saigon. I've never seen that many people. We were hanging on the side of the truck, and uh, it was just 
thousands of people and the, the driver was driving at 30 miles an hour and uh, it was just people just opened up. He didn't hit none of them. Pretty soon I found out while I was there because casualties started coming in and uh, we had to go in and first we was watching but then pretty soon we was assigned cases to do. An uh, incident that really stayed with me the rest of my life. We had a mass casualties that came in and um, the head of surgery and I was on this case. And this particular guy had been shot in the thigh. And uh, we had just started the surgery and down the hall, we had one guy, he needed surgery on his brain, on his uh, extremities. And so he had about four teams working on him. And they said, well, Dr. Von Gurman, we need you to help make some decisions. And we had just started the surgery. And he looked at me, he said, Special Cannon, uh, I believe you can do this. So uh, I'm going to um, scrub out and I, I want you to take care of this case. So he immediately broke scrub and left to go take care of that person who had the mass injuries. And I was left there to perform the surgery uh, from the beginning to end, and um, I did. I did the opening and uh, I debrided the uh, wound. I washed it out. I got the suture, the right suture, sewed him up, put the bandits on him. And of course, the nurses were looking at me all strange, like, what, he's gonna let you do it? But remember, I said he was the head of surgery, so he had the juice to do that. I don't think any other doctor would have done what he did. Everybody was walking around the um, surgery unit saying, you see, Special Cannon did that operation, and uh, I felt very good because uh, I knew I did a good job uh, for him. He was bandaged up right and well. And, um, and I, I felt real good about uh, uh, taking care of this uh, GI. And um, so I, I, was, I was kind of sort of like the king for a few days. I'm still very patriotic. I still love my country. But the Vietnam experience just helped me to love life and to live it to its fullest because you never know it can be taken away from you. And there's nobody who knows that better than American military veterans. I lost a couple people I knew when I was in Iraq. My dad lost people he knew in Vietnam. My grandfather lost people that he knew in World War II. And I'm sure if I go back, I could probably find people who knew people who died in the Civil War and the Revolutionary War. One thing about Specialist Cannon, I was really happy to hear that the uh, surgeon had confidence in the young specialist. And just having the confidence in somebody that he can do the job well was a big confidence booster for him. And you could tell just by the way he had shown in that interview. And even though that was 50 something years ago, 52 years ago, it's still really good to, uh, you know, to hear that story. Right now, we're going to take a look at what happened this last weekend in Stillwater. We had the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Foundation, the wall that heals, that came to town. And North Star Oasis was here to cover what was going on. You will not see the construction or the, take down, the tear down of the wall. That is not going to be in this video. But we will show you the 
uh, beginning when it was escorted to its uh, spot off of 6th Avenue. And we will show you some shots, uh, some scenes from both day and night. So this next clip was put together by your production team from North Star Oasis.
I'm so glad you came out to escort us in. But I absolutely expect every single one of you to come back and see us during the week. And I want you to wear your gear. And I want you to come say hi to me and come say hi to Wayne and come say hi to Bernie. And I want you to come see us at night. Because we have something that is so amazing to see at night. Guys, the wall is lit from the top. So it's actually, and don't tell my boss I said this, even more beautiful than the one in DC. He says that. Please, please come see us. Guys, I'm gonna present Mike, your ride captain, with a uh, his pin, and he actually gets the patch for free. You can hound him about that later. And he's gonna talk to you next. Thanks guys, appreciate it. Hey everybody, thank you for coming out. It's going to turn out beautiful weather, thank God. Uh, a couple things to know. Right. Yes, to go yes, see it. <laughs> Always got to wait for good ground. miles an hour under the posted speed limit. We'll have road guards deployed at some of the lesser intersections. Stillwater PD, Oak Park Heights, and Bayport PD will cover the rest. Um, I'd like to take a moment and ask everyone to uncover, bow your head, and say a little prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this gathering today. Thank you for keeping us safe here. Keep us safe on the way home. But more than anything, remember those who have fallen to protect our freedoms. Remember those who are serving, Lord, who have their lives in harm's way every day. Remember the peacekeepers here at home that keep us safe in our cities, and our firefighters that help keep us from harm. All of our EMS personnel that rescue us when we need them the most. Please, Lord, look upon us all and bless us. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, everybody, have a good ride. Thank you.
Let's give a huge round of applause to the person who volunteers his time to be here and his truck company who helps us get to where we need to be. And that's my man Bernie. So this is his third stop this year. He's been Bernie! Yeah. It's they were the only ones on those day. They were the ones that are in that group. In that casualty group. And sometimes, Which sometimes you can, we've group. lost 50, 60 guys in a day in the alphabetized. So you see Christopherson, Parker, Weir, Ben Alphabet. But that was at the end of the world. The day after they died, LBJ would die. About six days later, the Paris Treaty came. That's how close they came. If they had lived another week, they'd probably still be. So you have 62 guys from 73. One guy died in 1974. And 66 guys died in 1975, the year of the fall of Saigon and the Maya Gifts.
this first panel is our first two minute song from Robert Larson, uh, Morehead, Barney Cast from International Hall. Okay. This first panel here goes to like 1963. So it covers, I verified, it covers the first five years of the work. This next panel, the following five months of the work. only gets worse after this. It's very much worse. Because when you get down to panel 33, from there in the middle of that panel to the very tip, and then resuming on that tip down there, coming to panel 37, that's all 1968, the Tet Offensive. We lost 19,100, some guys in Out of 58,286 for total war, we lost just under 3 out of 10 guys. starts to send them down. Like Crockett, he died in 72, and these guys died in 73 and 5. So that has a lot of years too. By the time you get to it's a very dramatic crescendo going up to 1960. Did you tell me what you know that was for life? Did you find them? Yes, I did. Great. He died in May 12 of 68, so oh, the 5th month of the Tet uh, I signed my enlistment papers on the 5th of May of 75, still graduating from high school, <laughs> when I went in. Gosh. Yeah. Everybody told me I was nuts. I said, I'm going. Yeah. Thanks for what you did. Okay, it starts in 
one in, in one of those. And so that was what we had uh, here in Stillwater this past week. Now, of course, if you're watching in St. Paul and, in, and you say here in Stillwater, this is where we tape our episodes. So we tape out of the Valley Access uh, Channel studio in Stillwater, and we're very grateful uh, to them for being our gracious host. Uh, so every now and then we do have to make sure we uh, give them uh, a little bit of kudos. Uh, but when I found we found out that the wall that heals is going to be in Stillwater, that it, it's in our backyard, we had to cover it, and, and that's what we did. Uh, some of that you might actually see again coming in probably November with um, with um, Veterans Day uh, or possibly next spring and Memorial Day. Uh, but there's a few things that I, I think that we just got to go and re-edit and take one little section out. But nonetheless, that does not trivialize the importance of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Now, if you notice in the beginning of that, uh, of that video, it was kind of like a carnival-like atmosphere, a little bit of excitement when the wall was actually coming. You know, you hear the semi honking its horn, people cheering and clapping. And then it's more of a somber uh, tone once that wall is actually set up and you actually can go and visit it. I really hope that you took some time to go to the wall that heals this past weekend. And any other time that it's in Minnesota, I hope you, take, you get the opportunity or take the opportunity to go and pay tribute to those who had served and had uh, not returned. And... You know, that's why it's there. It promotes healing. Uh, what we are going to do right now is we're going to play you two back-to-back uh, -back stories. We're going to go back to Wisconsin uh, for Tom Schober. And then right after that, Vietnam veteran Bob Conrardi tells an interesting story of when a tiger followed his platoon. We're going to actually show those back-to-back. -back, and then after that, we are going to take a look at... I'm probably not going to be using the Prager University... Uh, segment that I had promised at the beginning of the show. I'll get back to that after we watch these two next segments. One in, in one of those books, there's a picture of me sitting there wearing a first calf jacket, uh, you know, uniform, and with about two or three Claymore mines, a couple of clickers, uh, blasting caps, and C4, because that's what I used to carry. I just took a picture of it one time for the hell of it. And uh, we used to rig up mechanical ambushes at night, too. The VC weren't the only ones who rigged up booby traps. What we could, we got pretty good at uh, rigging up uh, mechanical ambushes with claymores. And what, the way it would work is you take a, an old battery and rig a lead up to a blasting cap. The trick is you'd have to break the electrical circuit. So you'd have the two leads on the wires and you'd take a spoon or something, you know, an insulator, and you'd put it in between them somehow secure them together and then put a string on that. This, would all, this stuff would all be rigged up to the claymore and the battery. So the idea was that if you had a string on the, the spoon and you could string it across a place where somebody might come, if they hit it, the spoon pops out, completes the thing and it blows it up. General Schwarzkopf, if you think he looks scary now, imagine him 15, 20 years younger at about age 37 or 38. When he got off the helicopter and took over our, our unit, I looked at this guy and said, oh my God, we got a lifer here. We're in it now. And uh, he was a pretty good guy, actually. But he was pretty aggressive, too. He was, the, the guy that replaced him later on told me that uh, he was one of these five percenters from West Point that's, you know, destined to be stars. And uh, he was on track. And uh, he was getting his command, you know, the command experience. So he got a little aggressive, and he moved us around, and he had him had some guys doing night river crossings and things like that that weren't so good. But I did not dislike General Schwarzkopf. I thought he was a pretty good guy. I wonder sometimes, you know, what's going on. I hope, I felt kind of strongly that we all owe a debt to those that didn't make it to live our lives better, to try to do something to help people and not not just go off on your own and you know be a money hog like some of these cats that we've been watching in Wall Street. But I, I mean, feel very strongly that if I ever have to face one of those guys at the wall, I would like to 
be able to feel that lived up to it. One afternoon, we had a tiger follow us. And uh, we, were, we had a big security out. We could see because the elephant grass wasn't too bad. And you could see them off to the side. And uh, we needed permission to shoot anything like that. I went on an elephant hunt one day. But anyway, we needed permission to shoot something like that. So we called it in. And the company commander says, reverse direction. And I says, why? I need to go to point B. He says, uh, his, they found out that these tigers follow platoon because they know someone up ahead is waiting for them. And there's an ambush and a chance to get a meal. So the tiger found us as an omen, so we went the other way. So I never did find out what happened. But they, they learned quick. And uh, we're going to end it here, uh, our story. Actually, this, kind of, this one little, literally hits home with me because this is actually news I just discovered here. Uh, we're going to play a song called The Wall. And back in uh, 1982, when the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. was dedicated, it was uh, one musician who was also with the 173rd Airborne Brigade who uh, had a few other people around him and began singing God Bless America. And that calmed some tensions down, and ever since then it became a, a place of peace. And that person is Britton R. Small, known as Brit Small, of Skidmore, Missouri. On Friday, June 21st, 2019, he passed away at his home in Skidmore, Missouri at the age of 72. I've known Brit Small for many, many years. Um, my father introduced us back in the late 80s. Uh, he, ha he put together a band called... Um, uh, festival, the Festival Family Singers, and in the early 90s I even had a chance to play uh, trumpet with Don Strav from uh, his band Festival. Uh, very, very big part of the Vietnam veterans and the POWMIA community, and Britt Small is one of those guys who made an influence on my life. And go ahead and play the music, and I guess we're going to leave this one out for Britt Small. Uh, thanks for all that you've done, Brett. The world is a more peaceful place because of your presence. Settling as anger is with its possibilities of what it might lead to, it led to Brit Small, 173rd Airborne, retired. Oh,
And for Dallas Pearson, producer, I'm your host, Jeff Williams. You're watching North Star Oasis. And we're just paying the last bit of tribute here to the fabulous entertainer, Britt Small. Thanks again, Britt. And for the rest of you, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. of honor.